Welcome to episode 103 of the Civil War Breakfast Club podcast. With St. Patty's Day on the horizon, once again, I am joined by Mary the Canadian Leprechaun. I am merely a flat pint of Guinness named Darren. Top of the evening to you, Mary. How are you? Uh, I'm good. How are you? <laughs> oh, it's fantastic. It's, the spring is coming despite all the snow. Um, I'm looking forward to it. And despite, you know, despite the fact that spring is coming, Mary, you know, it won't be long now until spring will turn into summer. And this summer, they're going to have several 160th anniversaries of battles fought from 1863. It's going to be honored in Italy. We, as you know, my favorite has always been Gettysburg. To me, that the town is home. It's in my blood. It's part of my soul. And in the 160th anniversary of that battle is something I'm really looking forward to. To that end, there'll be thousands of people descending on the town in this July. And we are really wanting to put a spotlight on the yeoman's effort that's really being undertaken daily by a group that is really the straw that stirs the Gettysburg drink, and that is the Gettysburg Foundation. Now, if you're gonna talk about the Gettysburg Foundation, there's only one person really to talk to, and that's their president and CEO, Wayne Motts, who is joining us tonight. Welcome, Wayne, how are you? I'm doing very well, Darren. Thank you. Hi, Mary. Thank you for having me on, on the program. And just let me say, I'm not the only one you could talk to at the Gettysburg Foundation, but I'm very <laughs> pleased uh, that you asked me to come on today. And I'm a little, little embarrassed that, that I'm not wearing a green shirt, that I'm wearing a blue shirt, but I should have gone I've with that. I've got a blue shirt on, too. So <laughs> Okay, I guess I should have yeah, gone enough. with the blue Sure, but I, I, yeah, I want to thank the Civil War Breakfast Club. I want to thank you and Mary for uh, having me on on behalf of the Gettysburg Foundation. We're just honored uh, by everything we do, and there's just a lot of great efforts coming to preserve, a, you know, a great part of our uh, our history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for joining us for this. It's, it's no, really, it's great. I mean, it's awesome. Wayne is, is is you know, I know you're right. There's a lot of a lot of great people that that work for the foundation. But Wayne, you you are the true gentleman of Gettysburg, as they say, and I I don't want to talk i know you don't want to talk about your background but, I, but i'll do it for you real quick and it just you know and to stay with that saint patty's day theme is you know your background in the civil war field makes me green with envy okay <laughs> so, we'll, so we'll, we'll just leave it at that but wayne is a graduate of the ohio state university got the theme for you yay with a degree of military history you got his masters up the street at shippensburg he wrote one of the few books on Louis Armistead, that uh, Trust in God and Fear Nothing. That title, of course, is from Armistead's prayer book that he had when he was yeah. injured on the, on the Pickett's Charge um, at the Angle. He also wrote a book on Pickett's Charge with our, with our friend Jim Hessler, so you can go ahead and check that out as well. He is also a, a licensed battlefield guide, and, and most people know him from his previous days as that CEO of the National Civil War Museum up in Harrisburg that we visited not too long ago. Mm -hmm. And he was also the executive director of the Adams County Historical Society. So like we said, um, you know, for, for, for those who aren't familiar with the Gettysburg Foundation, you know, for you, Wayne, um, you know, what are, you know, we'll, we'll just hit you some real quick questions here is what are some of the, the things that maybe that you guys do that have your fingerprints all over them that maybe some people don't really, don't really associate you guys with? Well, yeah. So, and I, and I appreciate all that. And for me, I'm the little kid that ran around the battlefield visiting it, dreaming someday I could have a career in history. And now I'm so honored to be the president and CEO of the Gettysburg Foundation, leading this group of staff, volunteers, and board who really work with the National Park Service to help preserve and educate people about Gettysburg. So first of all, we are a 501c3 nonprofit philanthropic educational organization that works in partnership with the National Park Service to preserve Gettysburg and Eisenhower National Historic Site and to educate the public about their significance. That's our actual mission. And people forget we've got two parks at Gettysburg, two, not just Gettysburg <laughs> National <laughs> Military Park, but we've also got the retirement home of the 34th president of the United States, of course, a great student of Civil War history, uh, a Civil War Army, uh, you know, aficionado, I guess. And and that uh, you can't really, I think, understand how much Eisenhower loved the Civil War, toured people about it. We do basically three things, and one of those is to own and operate and maintain the National uh, Gettysburg National Military Park and Eisenhower National Site Visitor Center. So the building behind me, when you come to the main visitor center, it's not owned by the federal government. It's owned by the Gettysburg Foundation, and we own, operate, and maintain this 139,000 square foot building, which has the museum, which has the orientation film, and let's not forget $15 million worth of preservation work done on the site 
Pachyderma painting, probably the most significant and largest artifact being cared for here. Number two, we maintain three other properties, Children of Gettysburg Museum, uh, tickets to the past, Unforgettable Journeys, which is the train station, um, and also the George Spangler 11th Union Army Corps Field Hospital, three other properties we maintain. And then number three, we're really the Parks Philanthropic Arm to help raise money for projects. And we raise lots of money for the park for lots of different projects, which include battlefield rehabilitation like Culp's Hill, like Little Round Top. Uh, it also includes artifact preservation. It, it, it includes exhibits. It includes monument preservation, like toward the equestrian monuments that are on the battlefield, six of them that were recently uh, done with preservation money we helped raise. The U.S. regular monument, big in charge, raising money for that. So th those three areas, I think, are large, looming large on the list. And then to support education as well, which I guess would be a fourth area, uh, including the parks educational mission. Uh, to reach students. We raised money for traveling trunk program. Recently, we gave the money to help have that travel all over the United States. So, uh, so Darren and Mary, I'm sorry, that's a long explanation. <laughs> question, but that's, that's, perfect. that's what we do. You never get just a soundbite with Wayne Motts and be a battlefield guide all those years, <laughs> I guess. So sorry about that. No, uh, no worries. Well, I, I think what's, what's great is that you, your, your foundation really, it's to tell the story of the, the Battle of Gettysburg and a lot of other things. And really share the stories of all those who fought there, which is really, which is really amazing when you think about it. And to some of the things you brought up, you know, I think a lot of people are surprised. I know I was when I first learned about this a long time ago, that the foundation is dedicated to acquiring and preserving that land, as well as the artifacts and buildings around the battlefield. So to help those visitors, visitors gain that, you know, that and truly appreciate all those who gave that last full measure of devotion, as they said, as the guy with the hat said you know, over in the cemetery. And I think that the people are also surprised to learn, like you just said, that the foundation does own the visitor center. You partner with the park service, of course. And, and, and you, you kind of hit a whole bunch of things. So I think what we'll kind of do is kind of go through them kind of individually. Sure. And, and I, you know, is kind of hit them all. And cause really you guys, the Gettysburg foundation, you and your team, it's about enhancing the experience not just for the first time visitors, but also the long time people, right. people who go to Gettysburg way more than they probably should. <laughs> you can go to all your things and see something different every single time. And um, one of the ones you mentioned, which is, which is one I've always appreciated, is that Children of Gettysburg 1863 exhibit you do. Right. Because I know 10 year old Darren would have killed to go to that. Right. <laughs> There's no question. Now, in this, the, the key, and really the key to, you know, all of us have Gettysburg in our blood. It gets you and it never lets you go. And when you go, when you have that true family experience and, and that effort to educate and entertain children to talk about, about the Gettysburg exhibit, um, and it's not a children's museum per se, it, it's an experience that tells the stories of children who also lived in the town at the time of the battle. For those who haven't been, it's held at the John and Caroline Rupp House, which is right at 451 Baltimore Street. Mm -hmm. And um, and they lived there with their six children. The house is still there today. And I think you know the building pretty well, if I know correctly, over at the Gettysburg Foundation. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so and these kids, they get to go and experience the and hear firsthand account stories from living historians. Is is it young historians, people who try to be like Tilly Pierce and Sadie Bushman. Right. And they tell those experiences of, of what they all went through. Kids get to interact with living historians on, on, on the grounds. They get to Mary, they get to pick up soldier packs and see how much oh, they nice. weigh, carry that right. around. Okay. They do scavenger hunts. Um, <laughs> they, you know what they get to do? They even get to stand at a podium and read the Gettysburg Address. Can you imagine if that was me as a kid that got to do that? Oh my God, I would have loved to have done something like that as a kid. <laughs> and, and the best part about it is for kids under 12, it's free with the paid adult ticket. Right. And, and and that's the thing is what you're doing, Wayne, and your your group is you're injecting, you know, that thirst of knowledge, that 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 Civil War early age nerdery right into their veins at such a young age. And what that'll do is that it's gonna help bring them back because they're gonna want to go. They're not just gonna want to climb on the cannons and run around and get yelled right. at by people <laughs> <Rangers. laughs> right. They they want to experience all that stuff. So Right. If you're going to if you're going to help foster the next generation of of historians and and people who really appreciate it, 
that's the best way to start. And I, I, I just can't commend you guys enough for that because it is so cool. It just really is. It's a very unique experience. And there's no other experience in Gettysburg like it for the telling the history of the battle. And if you want to reach a 10-year-old kid, how do you? You do it. You tell a story that relates to them. And that's what I really like. It's it's very unique. It's very different. We opened that up in September of uh, 2021. And so in the year, we've had like over 11,000 visitors in, into this into this building, which is tremendous. One of my favorite exhibits, and I exhibit is the wrong word, Um, items in there, I guess, because it's a it's a hands-on exhibit, and all the exhibits in there are. People can touch them. You can, uh, like you said, pick up the backpacks and do some things. There is a figure in there called Bob that the students dress their wounds, and then they are asked to write a letter on Bob's behalf to his family. So they write that, and we actually have volunteers that answer back if they put their address on on the letter and we've actually had to do that so we've got uh some of the families have sent and they put that in the mailbox and then our volunteers have written back to these young children uh that have written on bob's uh bob's behalf so it's just a really unique thing and it really catches people where uh where that where they need to be and as you know, history education in this country, sadly, uh, in the nation's report card, history comes in dead last mm -hmm. in fourth, eighth, and twelfth grade, and that's it's really sad. So this is a way to to sort of supplement educational opportunities that are in the schools by hitting the learning at that level. And it's done. It's done respectfully. It's done. You know, honoring the soldiers, all the people who fought there, and really, what it, it gives an appreciation. So the kids. I mean, having I didn't realize that the kids. To get the letters back that's brilliant that's really yeah. that cool. idea that, that the ones that have addresses sometimes you know they don't put an address on it or something but if they do we have a volunteer that writes uh, that, that's right that writes back to that and, and they've done uh, you know not an insignificant number of those uh to, to interact with the kids which i think is tremendous that is really mary cool. you may need to uh fake a letter and throw it in the mailbox oh my god <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that that's great i mean that, that that's now, that is just such a fascinating, fascinating thing. Um, the George Spangler Farm in Field mm -hmm. Hospital. Uh, for anybody who's, who's visited the Spangler Farm, I, you know, I'm preaching the converter with this if you've been. It's one of Gettysburg Foundation's experiences. And, and they, they do tours of the farm, uh, which was the 11th Corps Field Hospital during the, during the battle. And they'll tell you all about it when you go with George Spangler and his wife, Elizabeth. They, they're in their four children. They stayed in one room during the battle. They stayed on site. You can, uh, you can tour the bank barn. Where uh, for both the Union and Confederate, well, wounded were both tended to. You can see the Rosecrans ambulance, Mary, if you go in mm -hmm. there, right? Yes, that was that, right? one of my favorite things to, <laughs> to see yeah. there. I mean, as I'm, my favorite core is the 11th. So I love going there. And it's just to me, it's such a, I don't know, you go there, it's a very, I don't know if I want to say, like, just, it's very humbling and, and sobering to go yep. there, especially when you realize that the soldiers, a lot of them were laying outside that field hospital waiting yeah. for amputations. And when we were there, um, we were there with some friends and two of us were standing in one part and we realized we would have been standing right where the amputations yeah. happened. And that yeah. is just like, it, it just, it kind of hits you, but the preservation there is amazing. Um, and it's interpreted so well um, by Gettysburg Foundation. Yeah, what's right. great about it is Thanks. You have volunteers who do the tours. One of our friends, Mark Blanchard, he's he's we've done he's taken us yeah. to tours. He's he's very knowledgeable, very great guy. You know, he'll show you you know you know where the dead were, the field where they were temporary temporarily buried. George Nixon, Company B of the Seventy Third Ohio, he was out there. Right. Um, the great grandfather Richard Nixon. Um, but the jewel for me, without a doubt, is the Summer Kitchen. It just is. Yeah, and it's a place where uh, our confederate general and our fellow masonic brother wayne louis right. armistead was right. passed away right so get right. that out there wow from his wounds at pickett's charge and, and and they'll tell you about the whole the whole thing you'll see the whole area and and that the tours begin i believe on june 9th again is when they start they, they always go from like june to august and you, you can check the website 
to make sure they have the dates. You know, Darren, one of the challenges out there is that the lane, of course, is, is very narrow. It has the yes. lane. So in most cases, you have to take a shuttle bus to, to, to actually go out there because they don't really have two-way traffic on the lane. There are times when we open when we open it up for special events. We have programs in the evening in, uh, on some cases, and then we have special weekends out there as well. So just check the website for the for the full schedule of the interpretation out there, which is really good. And you can, you know, they can all the tickets, all these events can be get at the visitor center. You can go there. Sometimes right. when you go, Mary, last time we went, they had Mr. G's ice cream that were handled. Yes. You get samples of Mr. G's. That was very so, cool. Yeah. We've so, had yeah. it out for like family free, you know, for family day or something. Oh, yeah. that we that's out what there. I think what we were out there for. We were <laughs> yeah, that's that's really nice. In a foundation, this is a this is an 80 acre piece of the property. Now, mm -hmm. during the Civil War, uh, Darren, you know, the, the property was 166 acres. The Spangler's mm -hmm. actually own is now Powers Hill, which is the artillery position. Uh, for the 12th Union Army Corps there. It's about 80 acres, and the foundation in 2008 really saved that, bought it for $1.8 million. And I, my and hopefully my colleagues won't be checking every fact and figure I have here, but I believe we the Gettysburg Foundation put in about $3 million in that property. So it's about $4.8 million uh, into the preservation of it. All the non-historic structures were taken down. The historic structures were rehabilitated. The barn is beautiful. My first visit there was in 1988, the first year I was a battlefield guide. The late Greg Coco, who wrote a book, Vast Sea of Misery on the hospitals, who was a battlefield guide, ranger at the park. I asked him, I said, you know, could I go out there? He gave me the number of the person to go out there. And my first visit out there was 35 years ago. And I remember coming out there, the man who owned it, Mr. Kenneth Andrew, came out, gave me a tour. Uh, pushed away the cobwebs on the barn. It showed when it was painted in 1875. We put a piece of plexiglass over that. It's still preserved. And he said to me, Wayne, I, I, someday I hope to see this preserved and interpreted. And you know what? Now it is. You know, Mr. Andrew died in 1998. It took another 10 years for the foundation to, to acquire that property, uh, got it from his family members, and then placed money in to rehabilitate it. 1,900 wounded soldiers, about 1,900 wounded soldiers. You mentioned George Nixon, Harriet Beecher Stowe's son. Uh, the officer of Uncle Tom's cabin. Her son was a staff officer, Mary, in the 11th Corps on Cemetery Hill. He was wounded, taken care for uh, in that property. Of course, Armstead uh, dying uh, in, in the property. A number of other well-known people uh, there. But there's so many stories to be told. Uh, and Ron Kirkwood, one of our volunteers, who was a professional journalist, wrote a book, uh, Too Much for Human Endurance, which you can get about the history of the farm. Oh, cool. Yeah. I Carl Schurz, I believe, was there. I think we talked about, uh, I think we were trying to debate. He came and visit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so yeah, I know Schurz came to visit. And we've got accounts of, of Schurz visiting. I'm not, I don't think, I don't think Howard was there, but Schurz definitely was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Francis Barlow at one time was cared for. Uh, in that property as well. He was cared for at several properties around the battlefield, oh. but he was cared for there. Yeah. And, you know, we said a million times, what's great about Gettysburg is the places you can go that are still there. And, uh, and I'll, I will say your, your staff of volunteers who do the, who do those tours are top notch. Uh, they, they really are. And that's really a testament, not just, not just to them, but to you guys as well, because they take the personal ownership and, and mm -hmm. of, of telling the story and they do it passionately, which is, which is, um which is really, really good. And that opens up in June. So certainly you can take advantage of that to go visit that. Our, our volunteers, Darren, just let me say, since you brought that up, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I no. I just want to make sure we get, I tell you how important they are to us. I I talked to many of them. I know many of them personally. We have over 100 regular volunteers, over 100 people that do regular volunteering at all the sites that, that, that we just discussed and that we had. We have someone that helps coordinate that activity with us. Mark, of course, who's uh, an educator, one of those volunteers that you mentioned, which is great. These folks could volunteer anywhere. They could volunteer anywhere. There's many places in Gettysburg they could volunteer in surrounding area. They chose they choose to spend their time with uh, with us. We also have hundreds of volunteers that come when we do projects. So, for instance, June. First weekend in June, we have Park Volunteer Day, and people come up and clear brush and build fences and paint stones in the National Cemetery. And that is well over 100 and some people that come for that. So we've just got a great group of loyal people, and they could be anywhere volunteering their time. They choose to do that with us and with the National Park Service and these projects, and it's wonderful. Shout out to them about how great they are. 
Well, I always say any That's organization awesome. is good as is, is good as, as the people who volunteer because because right. unlike people who draw a paycheck, these are the people who do it for the, for the love of the game, as they say in, in the right. baseball. That's right. So, so that's great. So one of the more recent events or exhibits you just opened up is one that Mary and I got to tour a few weeks ago, and that is the new ticket to the past events. And, you know, we had the, the pleasure of touring that a few weeks ago, and it's very, very cool. And I don't, it, it's, it just is, you know, it, it's it's held at the Gettysburg Lincoln train station, you know, which after the battle was that nexus, that hub of, of people who were visiting to look for the wounded uh, relatives who were at the, who were at the battle. It, you know, it was actually a field hospital even before the battle. It, it, right. it, it's got a lot of history right in that very building. Of course, everybody knows November 18th, 1863, right. Mary, then Abraham Lincoln yeah. showed up there but uh, in before this the cemetery dedication. But what's unique about this is, is the virtual reality. It's the technology. And it's um and it's really and it's so unique. I can't remember anything like that in any of these places. And just to give people an idea of what the, what this is, is when you walk in, they you you get to basically choose to live an experience of one of three people who are at the battle. There's Cornelia Hancock, which Mary did when we went. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the 23, 23 year old woman who volunteered as a field nurse during the battle. Uh, Basil Biggs, which is the one I did. He's a free black man who helped exhume the dead from the battlefield to help transport them to the national cemetery that was being built. And then Eli Blanchard, who was an Iron Brigade soldier and a musician, who helped soldier was uh, help the surgeons with amputations. And and what's it's not gruesome or anything like that. You you go in there and you put on those virtual. I don't know what the, the kids probably know about VR helmet thing they put yeah. on, and it's a full three hundred and sixty degree view, and it basically puts you in the mindset. Um, you're wearing this ocular device, and basically it drops you right into eighteen sixty three and see what they saw and they tell you their story and if you look close enough Mary, you might even see president lincoln we yep. talk about that <laughs> very there he is but really it's it's it puts you in a virtual reality moment where basil biggs or canary hancock they're telling you what they did and what they saw as they're pointing it out yep. and it's brilliant and it just it's it's for it's for every age group it's not scary it's not anything like that but um but Wayne, that's that that's an amazing one, and, and the fact that it's done in the actual spot, it, it makes it right. like we said before. We want to know how unique that is. That's one of the things that really makes that special. So first of all, there's no other experience like it anywhere in Gettysburg. So it's like the Children's Museum. That experience is very unique, and the experience at the train station is very unique as well. And once again, one of the reasons why we're doing this. So let's remember, Darren, is, is that we're trying to capture, we're trying to capture new audiences of people to come to Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. We want more diverse audiences. We want younger audiences. And this experience also has something for the old student of the battle. Maybe that's the wrong word, but folks that are interested in battle history, certainly with Eli Blanchard, you're going to get it. If you're interested in civilian history, you're going to get it uh, when it comes to uh, Cornelia Hancock and definitely Basil Biggs. Uh, and, and that's a more diverse history. So Gettysburg had just under 200 African-American residents at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg. The town had about 2,400 people in it, and about 200 were African-Americans. So the experience of all of these people come into play when it comes to the train station, and it's unique and different. And when you're in the train station, you're experiencing experiences that happened actually in that historic building. So not only is it different, but I don't know of another example of a historical 3D reality and uh, or virtual reality, I should say, historical virtual reality in the place where it actually occurred, not in a theater, you know, in a real building. So <laughs> no, it's a how very... do you guys come with... Okay. Uh, I was going to say, it's a very cool experience like uh, we were talking about before. Um, you know, I worked in the museum field for a few years, and the one thing was always to come up with ways for, for people to learn because everybody learns differently. Not everybody wants to look, come look at an artifact. You know, they want to experience the history. And with this, you do experience the history. And I have to say, like, you know, my own personal experience with it was Cornelia Han Hancock. That was such a fascinating story. I was very drawn in from it right from when it started. And it is so well done. Um, and I want to go back and you know, experience the other two that are part of it as well. And that's the thing is I think like, I, I think other people are going to feel that way too. Like, wow, I did, you know, this character this time, I want to go back and do those other people. And right. hopefully that's what happens. Right. 
Now, I was going to say, how does it come, that idea come about? I mean, does that get pitched? I mean, does that, does it, because it's, it's such a brilliant concept and it's been so unique that, that, do you remember the genesis of where that all came from? Yeah, actually, it came from the former president and CEO of the Gettysburg Foundation, uh, um, Matt Mullen. And Matt actually went over to Poland. He had a conference and he met the folks at the, or the group that did this for us called Time Looper. They've done a number of experiences. They've done experience like this at Pearl Harbor. So we're not we're not the only place. They've done it. And so this idea of the of virtual reality, I believe, if I'm not uh, if I'm I have my facts correct. He's the one that sort of got that idea and then contracted to work with them. Now, he left. And then after he left, uh, we've had other folks work on it, including myself, the whole staff of everybody working. Of course, the park, you, you know, help review it. Chris Gwynn, the chief interpretation and education. Uh, he looked it over. We got another set of eyes on that. And myself uh, working on a lot of the history of it. It's good that the president and CEO, at least in my view, the president and CEO at, at the Gettysburg Foundation has a history background. Uh, you've got to know a lot about a lot of things. You've got to know uh, nonprofit business. You have to know how to uh, manage and maintain and and, and help uh, lead and operate uh, a historical entity. But having the history background I have, that really helps me in this case, because I can look at that and say, no, we, we need to tell that or we we've got that so it's a great strength for me i uh, i think to be able to do that and then the other things luckily i've got great staff to help me along because my strong suit definitely wasn't numbers or <laughs> things like that and i've got a good staff to help me along with that darren and, Mar and uh, mary to do it at the gettysburg foundation but uh, the history part of it it's really good for me to have that sort of background to be able to to do that mm -hmm. well i think it's probably more, if you can work with people which you obviously can you know the history which you obviously have and you have that creative ability and take that the willingness to take the chances where you you have a good idea of what maybe the next steps are what what you know what are the next things to do right. as far as helping whether it be the children's the children's experience or this and you know everybody of course you know talks about the you know when you go to Gettysburg the first place you go is the visitor center so we're going to, so we're going to right. talk about the place and your background over there and you know everyone knows about the museum everybody knows you know the short film narrated by Morgan Freeman which is great and of course, the Cyclorama by uh, Paul Philoteau, that amazing painting that was displayed here in Boston, Mary, at one yes. point. Right? And, and one thing that, that we experienced about a year or so ago that that's, I don't think a lot of people take advantage of is the evening with the painting. Yeah. Right. And, and so if you enjoy the painting, it, the evening with the painting experience is simply put as a must do. It, it's after real quick. It's after hours. It, it, it's run by a licensed battlefield guy named Chris Brenneman. And, and he, he'll, he, what he does first is he tells you the story of the painting. He brings you up into like a breakout room and tells you the history. They pass around former samples of, of the painting. She can actually feel how coarse it is. And then and it's just a unique experience there. But then what happens is you get to go and get an up close look yeah. at the painting. You, you look basically, you know, from the, the behind the scenes of it. And you look up close and it, it's amazing because what happens is when Chris or whoever does the tour does it, he'll explain to you that not just the history, but he points out all the cool little idiosyncrasies about it. He shows you all the Easter eggs. He'll show mm -hmm. you where all the artists who painted it painted themselves into the painting. He'll show you where the generals, he'll show you where Abraham Lincoln is. He'll show you the, the debunked John Wilkes Booth theory of, of you know, <laughs> sitting, in, sitting in there as well. Um, but there's so many things about that that I think a lot of people do, and it's done so classically, and it's done. It's, it, but it's you sign up in advance, but I think it's one of those things that people don't really take advantage of. But I think they absolutely should. If you go on the website, you can look under events. You can see where we do evening of the painting, which we do about on a monthly basis. Uh, Darren. And as you mentioned, Chris Brenneman, who's a licensed battlefield guide, helps do that program. We had two staff members, um, licensed battlefield guide, Sue Boardman, uh, who's now retired, who worked, who worked for the Gettysburg Foundation. Wonderful, wonderful work she did. And the work that Chris does, both of these individuals are uh, co-authors of the Gettysburg Psychorama book uh, that was published some years ago. So these are the experts working on this. So when you go see Evening with the Painting, 
you, Chris, who's in there working on this, he can give you all the inside scoop of it. And what a great historical artifact and great piece of history, uh, not just as a work of art, but on the interpretive side. And if you go to the foundation website, you can certainly take advantage of those programs and you get to spend time looking at it and looking at the different figures that are in there. It's one of the most popular programs that we, we run. It sells out every time we have it, basically. <laughs> And it's amazing because you, you don't just stand on that platform with, where you go and you go the usual museum tour. You get to go behind the scenes and climb under it and go right up to. You can see where the, the those big anvils are weighting the fabric down, where it's where it's mm -hmm. curved, and you can see where the, the cannons are and all the the the, uh, the props they have. And it's it's such a different perspective looking at it that closely. And I've been to the visitor center probably three or four times since we went there last year to take the traditional tour. And you start to notice things because of the evening with the painting, and you start to look for that. Oh, that, that's where that, that's that, that's the off you know, the painter right there, and yeah. you know that's that's it, it, it. And he points out some of the historical errors, like Armistead's riding on the horse, right? Yeah. And li yeah. the little things that you're going to be a real Gettysburg seamhead nerd to even notice. But once you learn those stories, you you never forget them, and you go and point them out. And you, then what happens? Then you start telling people. You give your own tours, yeah. and start right. pointing these things out. Yeah. And that's how you know you're really learning is when the person who tells you the stuff, you're able, you're able to pass that on. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm glad to hear it sells out um, because that was something that was, um, that was a lot of fun. No doubt. I've been to it a few times now, most recently with Darren and I saw Sue Boardman present on it and she was terrific. She was yeah. amazing. I learned every time I've been, yeah. I've learned something new, but it just gives you um, a greater appreciation, not just for like that part of the battle, but for the artwork itself and all the work that has to go into it. Right. Um, and just to get up close to it like that is so, and all the little Easter eggs, that's what I love the most yeah. the Easter eggs. And yeah. the, the, I, I have the book and it is, it's really good. Yeah. I love the book. We used to not do it so often and we've, we've got so much request for it and so much demand. And so it's really great. We're able to, to offer it on a regular basis at the foundation and, and see that. And like you said, every time you go, you learn something. I've seen that painting. I can't tell you how many times in my lifetime. And every time I look at it, I, I see something else, a new mm -hmm. figure, something I didn't know. And you you always learn, you know, you always learn something about it. Uh, don't doubt about whether they're showing the little mistakes they made. He's outlines with like ghosts on the fence. And yeah, the guys, guys with no, no legs, legs or something. There's guys <laughs> with just... no legs on it or something. And like just the little things that you learn. And I'm not sure that, you know, the the listeners and viewers of, of the podcast here, if they were in the old visitor center and they saw it prior to 2008 when the new visitor center was built, what a, what a, uh, a, a great difference. If you're seeing it now and you never saw how it used to be, you look at it and you say, wow, that's great. But if you saw it in the way it was and now you look at it, it's even a bigger difference because you're seeing the whole diorama portion of it. So the artillery pieces, the actual three-dimensional objects that are used as a as psychorama is meant to be viewed which you really didn't have in the old building. And of course, when the psychorama was restored, they put many feet of the original painting back on, which included the ceiling. So the platform, the way it's being viewed, the types of artifacts that were in the front to create the diorama, none of that was really in the, in the, uh, in the older building when it was built in 1962 and was out and, you know, uh, until it was closed and it was brought over to this building. So if you saw it in the old building and you see it now, it's even a much bigger transformation than if you ever saw it before, I think. It's funny, people who've been around for a long time still refer to it as the new visitor center. It's almost like 20 years old, but it's still- That's what visitor. I refer to it as because the first I mean, time I went to Gettysburg, I went to the old it. visitor center. It, it'll, it'll be 15 years yeah. old this year. It's, it's 15 years old yeah. this year. And it's just, it's just wonderful. And kudos to the staff, our janitorial staff. We've had many of them with us for years. Look at one of the greatest comments we have of how clean this building is. Everyone- is working so hard to make sure that your experience coming into the Museum and Visitor Center at the National Park uh, is, is first rate. Every single person working in there, from the park staff to the foundation staff to all the volunteers, uh, it's flat out. And it's just, it's wonderful to see the reaction of people when they come in there because there's hardly any visitor center like it anywhere in the United States. No, but every day you walk and you look like it opened the day before. It's, you could eat off the floors and that place is so clean. Mm -hmm. It's pristine. And the museum is great. 
Um, they always have a lot of different different exhibits rolling through. Uh, they had a lot of stuff from Mead from Philadelphia there not too long ago, and you can go check that stuff out. And they always have the standbys, the weapons, and, and the uniforms, which is great as well. Um, now, I know you, Wayne, have something coming up in April here, the spring muster that, you, that you're right. rolling out here pretty soon. I want to see if you want to real quick tell somebody what that's going to be all about. So the spring muster, uh, and we have that event each year, and we have a fall muster for the friends of the National Parks of Gettysburg, which basically is our membership wing. It's been around since 1989. It was one of the earliest preservation groups working at Gettysburg to, uh, to try that, even before the Gettysburg Foundation. And we merged together, and the spring muster is really an event for the members of our organization. We have hundreds of them come from all over the United States to witness different educational programming that we have. We have some indoor educational programming, and then we have outdoor tours that are also on the battlefield. We do it in the spring, and we do it in the fall. And you can go to the website to GettysburgFoundation.org. They can go there and look at what the offerings um, are. And we've got something for everybody there. If you want to walk out on the battlefield, get a tour with a licensed guide as part of that. That's an in-depth tour of the battlefield. You can do that. And then we also have programs inside. So for those that want to remain inside, for those that aren't able to get around and move around on the battlefield we're going to have inside programs as well and I, i'm pleased to be giving one of those uh, in the morning on saturday april 22nd it's the weekend of the april 21st 22nd 23rd so saturday april 22nd and i'm going to be giving it on chaplains in the civil oh, war a very cool. unique topic uh, and I've got, I'm going to focus on chaplains, not just the Gettysburg, but elsewhere. What did they do? Uh, who were they? And it's, it's fascinating. And a lot of people don't know about that topic. So, you know, I've, I've sort of in, inserted myself uh, into the foundation muster staff uh, who's working on that because I've told them, look, the boss wants to give a program, Darren and Mary. So now the boss <laughs> is giving a program. I get really excited about it. So I'm going to be giving one of those. And that's just a wonderful event to bring people to Gettysburg. And that's part of the educational mission, part of the educational mission that we run for the foundation. No, it's really good to do that. Like, like Mel Brooks said, it's good to be the king, right? <laughs> it's, good to, it's good to be able to do anything. <laughs> The things you want to do, so yeah. good for you on I'm able to go out and do it. You know, it, it's still able. Uh, and as foundation president, I just, I, I just love to be able to get out and talk to the members. I know we have over twenty five thousand members, 23, 25,000 members, somewhere around there. We have so many of them. They're so generous, and they come from all over the world. And Darren, like you said, they come to Gettysburg. Many of these members come all the time. Uh, they come on a very regular basis. I was standing down in the visitor center not long ago talking to a gentleman, and he doesn't know who I am. And he's from up in northern Pennsylvania. And I asked him how many times he came to Gettysburg. Now, he's several hours from Gettysburg. And so when he comes, he's spending the night. And he said that he comes about 18 times a year. Now, you think oh. about that. Uh, and there are many of our many of uh, our visitors that come uh, time and time again. Repeat. We've got a lot of first-time visitors, but, boy, we've got a lot of repeat visitors, too. That'll feel good. It's happened to me. I was going down there so many times that I decided to buy a house because I was going down yeah. there so often. So, yeah. <laughs> got so cheaper. Now well, we got cheaper for you. The hotel industry is going to go broke, so I'm not going to be there as often. But <laughs> but, the, uh, but it's great. So yeah, now I'll be down there full time sooner, sooner versus later. But but you, know, you mentioned we kind of touched on at the very beginning uh, outside of these exhibits, all of the the rehab stuff you guys do in, in the little round top rehab is going on. I don't think people realize how much you guys have your hands on that as well, too. Oh, yes. One of the original projects done by the friends of the national park of Gettysburg, which merged with the foundation I mentioned was the bearing of the power lines many years ago for long time listeners and viewers. They may remember when you drove down Emmitsburg road, you saw power lines. That's what you saw when you went down Wheatfield road or Pumping Station Road, one of the earliest preservation efforts was to bury those power lines. A great educational, you know, a, a great uh, preservation effort, I should say, on behalf of the Friends of National Parks of Gettysburg, now the Gettysburg Foundation. Recently, of course, Culp's Hill uh, was rehabilitated. The foundation and our donors, the major donors, uh, one of our board members, Cliff Bream and Julie St. John, large donors in that project to help rehabilitate Culp's Hill, bring the sight lines back. Uh, to the way it was back in 1863. So when you're touring that now, you're seeing it for the first time, probably, you know, in, in over a hundred and some years after I grew up as to what it looked like during the time of the battle. And then the little round top 
uh, project. I think the most recent numbers, the basic con- the base contract, I think for Little Round Top was around eleven million dollars, and the Gettysburg Foundation raised a uh, three million dollars of that money to help preserve that, rehabilitate it. Uh, unfortunately. It's closed, as you know, for an 18-month period, uh, Darren and Mary, and we're sorry that it has to be closed. But listen, it's the most visited Civil War site probably in the entire United States on any battlefield. And and millions of people have stood on it, and it needs help when it comes to erosion, monument stabilization, trails, all these things the Park Service is rehabilitating. It's going to be a new, improved, and better little round top if we can just endure a little pain uh, until it, it gets it gets finished. So It'll this worth it. year, we hope to have that open. It closed last uh, summertime. We'll be closed there. So hopefully this sometime this time next year, we hope it'll be back open again with all these improvements. It's going to be wonderful. But what, what it's doing is it's driving people, like you mentioned, Culp's Hill to all the parts of the battlefield. I mean, with all the work that's been done, I remember, you know, going back to years ago, it, it was how thick it was. Now you can see Forbes Rock right from the street. You can walk down behind the second, you know, the second Maryland. You can walk the whole battle line of George, Lang, you know, uh, Maryland Stewart's right up the hill and see everything. So it, it's I think what it's doing, it's it's forcing people to look elsewhere because the times we've been there recently, the people are still there and they're still in the battlefield. And as disappointing as little round top is closed, I mean, there's other there's other there's other rides at Disney besides Space Mountain, you know, there's other things you can see. So go out and see the other parts of the battlefield. I mean, you know, there's so many places you can go. Uh, you know, obviously Oak Hill is a beautiful place for the sunset people. We love the sunset at Round Top, mm-hmm. East Cemetery Hill, you know, obviously East Calvary Hill. But Culps has always been that 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 one place. I think that if if, if people were forced to go, uh, they would go a lot more often. And I think um, they, it wasn't part of the, the Gettysburg movie. It wasn't part of Michael Shara's book. So people don't always know the history of the David Irelands of the world versus the Joshua right. Chamberlains. But if, they're going to be forced to learn now, and they're going to see it. And then then when they start going back, hopefully going to a lot of your events, they're going to stop over at Culps Hill now instead of always going to other parts. Uh, this opportunity gives people the chance to sort of reorient their visit, in my view. While Little Round Top is always a stable where people went, it does give them time to explore other parts of the battlefield, which I yeah. think are are very, very important. The battlefield is 25 square miles. It's about 6,000 acres <laughs> when you look at the space. There's plenty of space to be out there to visit, to learn about. And so you're right, Darren. There are folks that are visiting. There's a lot of opportunities for you to catch the history of a lot of places, you know, related to Gettysburg there. There's been many times I've been walking up Baltimore Street and someone will say, say, ask me, you know, where's the battlefield? I'm like, you're in it. The whole town's yeah. a battlefield. And right. so now with, with the ticket to the past and the Children's Museum, you're going to help bring people into the town where a lot of people might not experience the town. They're used to seeing the driving the, the loop and, hit, you know, all, all the visitor stuff. But now they're going to be into the town as well. So it's kind of open up that concentric circle now to see more of the town and learn more from of the other right. stuff that went on in the town. People don't realize the all the stuff that went on right in that area because it's not the traditional green space that they're used to. Right. I'm a storyteller. So one of the things that I like to do, and I guess my background as a battlefield guide as a small child, my father used to read me excerpts of a diary of a Civil War soldier who killed a more silent in South Carolina. He was in the regiment behind the 54th Massachusetts, in the brigade behind the 54th Mass. And he came from the area where I was from. He was killed in action in the Civil War. His diaries were were sent to his brother. My dad would read me those diaries. I got interested in the Civil War because I made a personal connection with an artifact and with a person. So what I want to do as foundation president is to continue to set and chart the course of the foundation. And I think everybody's on board with that with telling stories. Mm -hmm. If you want to get people interested in the civil war, tell a story. And we want to tell different stories. We're going to tell stories we've always told. We're going to try to tell different stories. And we're also going to try to reach new audiences. Last year at Sacred Trust, I gave an entire program on a trooper at East Calvary Field, who was a Michigan cavalryman, and he was a first-class passenger, and he died on the Titanic, and he fought in the Battle of Gettysburg. And I'm not sure hardly anybody has written uh, has written about him. I found uh, and I wasn't the first person to find it, but there's a Muslim soldier that fought in the Battle of Gettysburg. He fought at Neal Avenue <laughs> so, within one of the units uh, that's there. 
uh, you know, Mary, I know, I guess you're Canadian, right? We've yeah. got Canadian connections all over the battlefield. Yeah. We want to get people interested. Uh, we've got to tell different stories. Two of the two of those officers I researched at Gettysburg were members of the Papal Guard that guarded the boat. Uh, these are stories to be told, and they're just waiting. And there are so many of them everywhere we discover them. So what I hope we can do at the foundation is to partner with the park whether it's on the battlefield, whether it's in the museum, no matter whether it's at our educational programming, park us, and tell stories that grab people and make them lifelong learners. Why is Gettysburg important? What connection does it have with us? And boy, I got to get there as soon as I possibly can. That's what we want to we want to do. And we're going to be successful in that if we can tell different things, attract people, tell stories we've always told related to the battlefield. There's so many, the, the, the blackboard is blank and all we have to do is write on it. My view. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's what, what, that's what we try to do in the podcast too, is just tell the stories because that's how you reach people. It's those like the human stories. So right. people can make a connection and kind of form a bond with them and can just, they want to learn more about it. Well, that's what's great about like the ticket of the past. You know, we always said that you know corps made divisions, divisions made brigades, brigades made your regiments and yep. regiments and companies. But companies are made of husbands and brothers and fathers at that grassroots level and learning their stories and bringing them up. And that's why the the, the Basil Big story is a great story over there, and and all the, uh, all the ones that you talk about because we can not everybody can relate to Robert E. Lee or George Meade, but they can relate to. Uh, you know, one, you know, one of the small group of people who had to charge Camus Wilcox in the first Minnesota, what, right. one of the ta- one of, they can relate to one of the Taylor brothers, you know, th- right. those are the stories they can relate to because they're regular people like us. And so, and that creates a thirst of knowledge and intellectual curiosity. And we've always said that, you know, you don't choose your battlefield, your battlefield chooses you, you go and it draws you in. Mm-hmm. And then right. once it draws you in, then you want to learn as much as you can about it and you read and you focus on it. And then, and then you pass on that knowledge to the next generation and you hope that that spark is there. And that's that. And, and what, what you guys are doing with the Gettysburg foundation is really uh, extenuating that by, by pushing these other events for other types of, of, of demographics, the people who aren't, who aren't going to go and dress up and reenact your clothes. Right. The people who want to go and they want to sit at the, the bar at the blue and gray and they want to go see some, a ghost tour. Right. They're going to they're going to go into the ticket of the past. and They're going to learn uh, about Cornelia Hancock and go, man, there's so much. And, and, and then then it goes from there. So that's why what you guys are doing is, is just it's invaluable because uh, right. and it's and it is very unique to Gettysburg. Like there are so many things that are unique to Gettysburg. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I And, you know, once again, as we move forward on this. All we need to do is capture these types of stories, in my view, and push them forward and make these connections, and people will get interested. The population of this country is going to look different 30, 40 years from now than it does today. We want to make sure that we're taking every possible step we can to reach out to everyone. Why? Because Gettysburg is important to everyone. What happened in this battle uh, and what happened here really is a watershed event in not only the history of our town, but the history of the nation and the history of the world. And what Lincoln said when he came here four and a half months later, that's all relevant today. I tell everybody, you don't have a a, a march uh, in Montgomery, Selma. You, you don't have these things unless you have the march at Appomattox. You don't have, you don't have it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the 1965 march for civil rights, you don't have that unless you have the march at Appomattox, almost 100 years earlier these are important connected things that we have that we should have discussions about and we should talk about Completely yeah, agree. And, and we tell people it doesn't happen that long ago i remember you know years ago you know sitting sitting over at sweeney's one day and there was an old codger sitting there at the bar and he, you know and he shook my hand and he told me he goes you just shook the hand of a man who shook the hand of a confederate soldier who fought here and yeah, like, oh, yeah. Up. and he explained to me that as a small child he was at the reunion in 1938 and so he's he's probably gone now. This few years ago, but it reminds me like, man, this is not that long ago. This is just there mm-hmm. are people here who still have connections to here. And I think if people get out of that mindset that this is an the Civil War is an old war that it's been the past, we still live with that today. There are still so many 
marks in this country today because of that battle and especially Gettysburg. And the more you learn about the Battle of Gettysburg and the Civil War, the more you're going to learn about today. And, and, that, and that, that's why it's so important to keep doing what you're doing. Everybody who's out there, you know, putting the reenactor clothes on, the living historians, you're keeping the memories of these people alive. And that's maybe if you're into history, if you're a historian, it's sacred. That's the most important thing you can do as a historian is keep the people alive and keep telling their stories. Well, I, I, you know, like I said, I, for the Gettysburg Foundation, we just want to say how grateful we are to our partner, Steve Sims, uh, the superintendent of Gettysburg National Military Park, and, and that we have been entrusted to help preserve and educate people about this, about this place. So we do that. in partnership with our park partners we're grateful for that partnership and we've got a lot of great things going on and like you said a lot of times people don't realize all the great things going on it's a busy time here <laughs> all the time uh here in mary well, last question for me because we're coming up against the hour here is is without giving away too many company secrets here wayne you know what's next for gettysburg foundation what are some long-term goals that maybe we can look forward to five ten years down the road well, long term, I, you know, one of the things we really want to do at the Foundation, the Court Series Battlefield Projects that the superintendent is asking us to support, and they're developing those right now. Just recently, we uh, helped contribute some funding toward two documents for both the Rose Farm and Trussell Farm, two very historic farms on the battlefield. The Gettysburg Foundation raised money for documents that needed to be created to chart the course of preserving those pieces of property. And that's those are in the future. So the first thing you got to do is get the proper planning documents. One of them was a historic structures report. The other is called a cultural landscape uh, management uh, report, cultural uh, landscape resources, I think is that what, what they call it, CLR. Uh, those are documents that are foundation documents that assist the park in <laughs> preserving property. So long term, you're going to see those properties uh, that are going to be preserved. Second, one of the things we're working on right now, which I'm very excited about, and our spring appeal that's going to be coming out soon is going to be requesting funding for this. And that's to assist the park in getting positions in the curatorial space for the Gettysburg National Military Park in the visitor center. When I started 35 years ago as Battlefield Guide, there were at least five museum positions in the visitor center to maintain the over a million items. There's over 1 million items in the visitor center related to the three-dimensional collection of the Gettysburg National Military Park. Today, there's only one curator. When I started, there were five staff members working there. Gettysburg Foundation is going to try to bring long-term assets to assist the park in cataloging, preserving, exhibiting, this collection, get more of these items out, cataloging and preserving the collection. Guess what? The archaeological artifacts that are found on Little Round Top, they got to be preserved. They've got to be mm -hmm. captured. They've got to be processed. And to do that, the National Park Service needs trained assets in the form of curatorial staff to help in that process. And the Gettysburg Foundation is going to be providing those assets. So that's something, I mean, not only, you know, the, the battlefield is such an important treasure that we have to preserve it, but I'm a museum person at heart. I also know that the objects that are in the museum are the last tangible objects related to the American Civil War and how important these tangible objects are to being preserved. So in the museum world, we've got to think about what we have left over that the Civil War soldiers actually handled what they actually work with, what what they actually belong to. And the Museum and Visitor Center preserves 1.25 million items. Think about that, uh, related uh, to the American Civil War. These are historic treasures that deserve to be cataloged, that deserve to be processed, that deserve to be shown, uh, that deserve to be told stories about, we have. And, and the foundation is going to help there. Oh, that's awesome. That's that's good to know that they're going to be like they're going to be looked after to be preserved. You know, everybody can you know you can sign up and you can volunteer your time, or you can volunteer you know financially. The Gettysburg Foundation, both Mary and I, both members of the Gettysburg Foundation, we um, send our check in every year, and um, and you get a lot of benefits for for that. You, you access to the visitor center and uh, the, the wheels, the wheels house, and some other things you can get involved in with with just being a member. So. But more importantly, you're donating to help to all these things Wayne's talking about to raise money for 
preservation for, for these acquisitions to, to for the staff. So if um if people are out there or feel the same way that we, we all three of us do about about Gettysburg, the town, um, get involved in some way. You know, go online, sign up for the Gettysburg Foundation. You can become a member. You can, I think it's thirty-five dollars. You can sign up. Yeah, small little amounts, and it, it pays for itself because you, it gets you free access to the visitor center of the movie. And, you, and, and but you're more importantly, you're donating to a great cause. So, well, thanks. I mean, if you go to the website at GettysburgFoundation.org, you can hit there right at the top. It says join or give, and that's that's where you want to go. You can join and be uh, a member of that. That will get you access, of course, to what you what you've talked about. I should mention, and I've been remiss in not mentioning it, but we should mention the Will's House. You just mentioned that a few minutes yeah. ago. Yep. National Park Service owns the Will's House. It's not a foundation uh, structure, but we have partnered with them. We try to because that journey for Lincoln, you know, coming up, Lincoln gets off at the the train station he goes one block north and where does he stay he stays in the david wills house yeah. so in the footsteps of lincoln that's a that is a very important place and of course the david wills house you can go online and you can look at that in in tour i would recommend gettysburg foundation.org i'd recommend uh nps.gov front slash get nps.gov front slash get g-e-t-t and gettysburg foundation.org these are two of the websites uh that you ought to look at and you can do destination gettysburg as well dot or if you want to travel you know if you're coming what, what restaurant you know where do i eat what where do i stay a destination gettysburg is your one stop for for all that no, it, it's a great thing so for people out there who love gettysburg you know you, you appreciate the work that gettysburg foundation does uh, support them because they, without them and groups like that, they, they, it's not going to be around forever. So any final questions from you, Mary, before we let Wayne no, go? I think that was awesome. Thank you so much, Wayne, for joining us for this. Um, Gettysburg Foundation is an amazing thing um, that's helping to preserve the history and tell the stories and bring people into Gettysburg. Thank you, Mary. Thank, thank you, Darren. On behalf of the Gettysburg Foundation, we, we want to thank you for having us. Uh, once again, we want to shout out to our Gettysburg National Military Park partners who are really preserving the you know the battlefield and educating visitors we supporting them in that role we want to thank everybody at civil war breakfast club thanks a lot and get involved you know help us because it's a lot of great stuff and the proof is right in front of your eyes you're walking out <laughs> around wherever you go it's really great and you can really make a difference you know they say does one person make a difference they sure do so help us. Thank you for, for allowing me to spend this time with you on behalf of the Gettysburg Foundation. Well, thank you for spending it with us and joining us for this episode. Yeah, it's an honor to have you because it's, uh, it's uh, you you obviously, like a lot of folks, you put your, your blood, sweat, and tears into this. And so uh, it's important that people get out there and, and know what, what you guys are doing, what everyone's doing, because um because people tend to, creatures are creatures of habit. They tend to do their own things, but Go see some of the new things. Um, definitely check out those exhibits we talked about because uh, they're fantastic. And, and you'll go and, and once you go the first time, I'm, I'm convinced you'll always go back. And that's what's great about this yeah. whole thing. And a lot of it is because of the great work by Wayne and his team, the entire Gettysburg Foundation. So again, Wayne, thanks for joining. It's a real honor to have you on with us. It's really, it's just been a lot of fun talking about this. We could go on all night talking about this stuff, mm -hmm. but I know, but I, <laughs> but I know that, that it's, it's a long day for you. It's a long day for us as well. So um, again, um, you're welcome back anytime. We're going to be doing a trivia night tonight. If you want to stick around and answer some trivia with some of the gang, you're, <laughs> you're welcome to. <laughs> but, but, yeah, I appreciate that. Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Definitely, it definitely yeah. is. So, guys, what's next, for, what's next for us, Mary? So, next up, we are going to be having our friend MJ on to talk about uh, her portrayal of Pauline Cushman um, being a living historian. And then um, in April, we are going to be joined by Dr. Pete Carmichael to talk to us about something Gettysburg related. And we will probably have another episode uh, before we have him on as well, but that's what we've got coming up for us. We've got a lot of guests all of a sudden, which is pretty cool to do. Uh, it's pretty cool to do. So everybody out there, thanks for listening. We appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your week. We'll be doing our Facebook, our YouTube live, I guess it's called now at 10 o'clock on Sunday. So jump on. This episode will be on YouTube tonight. It will drop on Saturday morning. So check that out. And uh, anybody who... Uh, who has any questions, go up right on the website for the Gettysburg Foundation. You can, all the things we talked about, including the, um, the, the, donor, the donors and signing up, is all right online. 
and, uh, and they would be happy to have you. And it would be an honor to uh, to have them as well. All right. So off we go, Mary. Again, Wayne, yeah. thanks so much for joining us. We'll talk to everybody on the other side. Happy St. Patty's Day, everybody. Happy St. Patrick's Day. See you guys later. Bye.